Bon, donc on va partir à la partie séminaire de la séance de ce matin. Et je vous rappelle qu'il y a un mini-workshop cet après-midi euh, qui commencera à 14h et qui aura lieu en salle 2. Euh, et maintenant, je vais passer à l'anglais pour présenter notre euh, orateur. Uh, so, uh, I'm very pleased to, to have Olivier Parcolet as uh, uh, the speaker of this last seminar of this uh, lecture cycle. Uh, many, many of you in the room already know Olivier, but uh, it's kind of a tradition to present the speaker a little bit. Olivier uh, uh, did a remarkable uh, PhD at École Normale Supérieure. Uh, in which uh, he uh, unraveled beautiful connections between uh, large-end theories of uh, quantum impurity models and condo models and uh, conformal field theory. Uh, but also, in the same uh, PhD, he actually was a pioneer of understanding what happens when you have a mobile electrons in what is now called the SYK model, which was called at the time the Sage-Defier model, uh, where he was the first to reveal that uh, uh, the strange spin dynamics of this model actually leads to linear resistivity, uh, and to understand that there is an underlying conformal invariance of these uh, equations. So that was quite an achievement, two achievements for, for a PhD. Then uh, he moved uh, to Rutgers as a postdoc, where he worked, uh, not so surprisingly, with Gabby Kotlia, and got exposed to dynamical mean field theory, which he had not really done during his PhD, believe it or not. Uh, and there he pioneered uh, the use of cluster extensions of DMFT. He, I think he wrote the first paper that reveals the differentiation between nodes and anti-nodes in the two-dimensional Hubbard model with cluster DMFT. Uh, already at that time, he was fascinated with modern programming techniques and efficient algorithms, and he decided to uh, create uh, um, a, computer, uh, a code library, which is called Toolbox for Research on Interacting Quantum Systems, which he has developed with Michel Ferrero and now several other people, in particular Neil Spencer. Uh, and this library uh, has had great success and is still being very, um, very much expanded and developed on a daily basis. Uh, Olivier then uh, thought that he needed to think of uh, new methods beyond DMFT, apart from cluster methods for which he developed several algorithms, but uh, one of the methods he has thought about is belongs to the second category of method I was mentioning earlier this morning, namely methods in which you actually rely on the calculation of vertex functions of the impurity model to take better account of uh, spatial correlations on the same footing uh, than one particle quantities. And uh, after many years at the CEA uh, Saclay, at the Institut Physique Théorique, uh, Olivier recently moved to New York, uh, where he leads the activity on quantum embedding theory and the development of algorithms for quantum embedding theories, and recently uh, has pioneered uh, real-time implementations of diagrammatic Monte Carlo to study the autoequilibrium dynamics of quantum systems. Uh, that was a long introduction, but I think Olivier deserves it, and now we're going to listen to his talk. Okay, thank you, Antoine, for the very nice introduction and the opportunity to, to talk here. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry? Okay. Um, so today what I want to do is, as we, uh, Antoine asked me, uh, to, to present some uh, talk about vertex-based methods, approach beyond dynamical mean field theory, and to do that, basically, I will do a talk in two parts. The first part will be some relatively standard material for DMFT. Think of it as a piece of lecture about how to compute susceptibilities and transport, which uh, Antoine could not cover in, in his lecture. And I will use this material after that to uh, describe the vertex-based approaches. So what do we want to, to do? Well, we all want to solve the quantum anybody problem, meaning we want to develop methods and algorithms that will allow us to solve models like the Hubbard model, 
and understands materials, like the very famous high TC superconductors. And there are, there are currently, there is currently an explosion uh, of many methods uh, in the field. Um, you know, and I put some of them here on these slides with a lot of progress in, very, in various directions. For example, in diagrammatic Monte Carlo, uh, or even in more traditional Monte Carlos, or with new methods that uh, take into account the structure of the many body wave functions, including new machine learning insights. But what I'm going to concentrate here today is about one subpart of these uh, landscape of algorithm, meaning so-called quantum embedding methods, which is a new fancy name to say uh, DMFT and beyond DMFT, right? Uh, and among these methods, I, I have stolen Antoine's uh, slide about the family tree, <laughs> just to say that uh, I'm going today to discuss only one part of the extension here, fundamentally the Trilex method, the D-gamma A method. Uh, there are many others, like the dual method, but that was too much for, for, one, slide, for one, uh, one lecture. All right, so I'm going to do that. So if I want to go beyond DMFT, the natural question is why? I mean, what is missing in DMFT? And that's going to connect directly to what um, Antoine did at the end of his lecture. What we lack, as was explained a few minutes ago, is um, the short range, so the effect of short range spatial correlations. I would add another thing. Uh, what, what's lacking in DMFT is a control parameter. We'd like to have method that we can systematically control we like to have a small parameter which we can push uh, to convergence, at least in theory, maybe not always in, in practice. And to achieve the, these uh, cluster DMFT were introduced. And in order to distinguish cluster DMFT from what I'm going to discuss, I have prepared one slide about cluster DMFT just to tell you a few things, and because I will refer to it uh, a bit later. So the idea, as, as was uh, Antoine said, is of, of cluster DMFT is simple. Um, instead of taking one atom in a self-consistent bath, uh, as in DMFT, you take a couple of atoms, four atoms, two atoms, maybe, uh, in a self-consistent bath. That's a real space picture. If you prefer to think in reciprocal space, uh, this is about the same as taking some patches in the aubry zone and adding some k-resolution, some k-dependence for your self-energy. Your self-energy is k-independent in DMFT. It is... Uh, of course, uh, the foreign clusters, you will start to reintroduce some k-dependence. Because of these clusters, you will capture short-range fluctuation. For example, if you are in a regime, maybe the pseudogap of high TC, which, are, which is you know, dominated by some kind of singlet physics, with short-range singlets, clearly you cannot do that with a single atom. You need two, at least. Uh, and you know, this kind of physics was reintroduced by clusters. And the control parameter is here the size of the cluster. If I was able to size to, to, to converge very large cluster uh, everywhere, then I would have solved the problem completely. So there has been a huge amount of work by many authors about these clusters. And you know, we don't find many things in the Hubbard models. Typically, we find a phase diagram where you have a D-wave superconducting dome, where you have a manifestation of the pseudo gap with the differentiation of nodes and anti-nodes. So all of that's very good, but um, the point is that it's still very difficult to solve very large clusters, especially at, at low temperature. So at high temperature in this region here, in the pseudo gap, there is a very nice paper by Wei Wu and Michel and Antoine, who show that indeed you can converge that as well as diagrammatic Monte Carlo. But in, in general, you know, it's, it's difficult, and therefore this is not the end of the story. We need more. So what are we missing in cluster DMFT? Uh, well, clearly one thing we are also missing in DMFT is uh, when, when you have long range correlations, a low energy mode uh, from a long distance, or even directly long range interaction like a coulomb term in your interaction, that's difficult to treat. And as Antoine mentioned, so we are saying exactly the same here, that what really is important is the feedback of these low energy collective modes into one particle properties. As I will show, DMFT can compute chi q of omega, uh, any Q, any omega uh, in, in the DMFT approximation, but what is not in the DMFT is a feedback of this uh, long distance mode into the physics of the one body particle, and that can be very important. That's, that's one of the main things that we want to reintroduce. Now, there are plenty of problems where you want to do that. One famous problem are quantum critical points. When you have some quantum critical points, you may 
um, have you know, a critical mode, a bosonic excitation, which is very long, very long distance, low energy, and that may affect the one particle physics, it may destroy the Fermi liquid, and in reverse, the low energy mode of the Fermi surface may provide Landau damping to that bosonic mode. So there is an interaction between the bosonic mode and the, fermionic, and the Fermi surface, which we need to capture if we want to go beyond the, the standard hertz millis theory. But that is a relatively complex problem, and I have chosen to illustrate the methods on a much simpler problem here, which is also the problem that has been discussed before, meaning the two-dimensional Hubbard model at weak coupling, so something we should be able to understand relatively well. So let's consider the two-dimensional Hubbard model uh, within DMFT uh, as a function of temperature on U. Um, the point is that DMFT predicts an antiferromagnetic order with an AL temperature even in two dimension, uh, like this. So that's the gray line here. Of course, we know physically that in two dimension, this is not the real life, there is a so-called Mermin-Wagner theorem from the, from the 60s that tells us that, in fact, there is no order, but there is a very long correlation length, psi, which is exponential with temperature at the, way, at the pi pi wave vector. And we have, therefore, long range fluctuations. And we know from you know, uh, analytics, early analytics, that this antiferromagnetic fluctuation will destroy the Fermi liquids will destroy the quasi particles and open the pseudo gap. And that's you know, the basic physics which we want to understand. So that weak coupling, we more or less understand the physics, uh, which you can understand diagrammatically by saying, OK, I have my fluctuation, and I'm going to couple it back into my self-energy with the simplest diagram. And then you can proceed from there. So this, mo this model is a very ideal benchmark for the methods which we want to study. And I will use that uh, uh, later and show how the, these methods can indeed do better than the MFT in that. So just here, these are the Fermi surfaces when T prime is equal to zero. The effect is due to the fact that the Fermi surface is nested, meaning two points of the Fermi surface are related by Q vector. If you have some T prime, then it's only true for some of the points of the Fermi surface, the famous called hot spots, where the, the electronics, I mean, the, the, the self-energy will be profoundly affected by the fluctuations. So these are the, the motivation. Now, the second point is you can enlarge a bit the point of view and consider the high TC superconductors. Uh, there has been, you know, of course, many uh, theory uh, directions to understand the high TC superconductors, but two of them are you know, precisely doped mod insulators and spin fluctuation theory. So in early days, and this is still developed uh, today, uh, in this kind of spin fluctuation approach, precisely people emphasize the effect of these antiferromagnetic fluctuations, because there is somewhere here a critical point that, you know, may have some effect um, in the pseudo gap. As I said, certainly at very weak coupling, um, this is uh, correct. Now, we know also that these, these compounds are doped mod insulator here at zero doping. So that's, of course, the da phase diagram of the high TC, the function of temperature and doping. At zero doping, you have doped mod insulators, and there is a line of research which emphasizes that point, uh, the fact that this is mod physics, that you should restore short-range correlations, maybe singlet physics, starting with the early work of Anderson, the slave bosons of Cotillard and Liu and others, and the modern techniques to approach these are clusters DMFT. So what we'd like to, to do here is to have a formalism that can have this at the same time, can have both if you want asymptotically, if I'm going to weak coupling, I'm going to have spin fluctuation theory. If I'm going to strong coupling, I'm going to have cluster DMFT. And well, intermediate, in intermediate coupling, I will learn something. And of course, some kind of method that I can control, ideally. Uh, so that's, that's one of the motivation uh, for these, uh, these methods. All right. Now, uh, before I go into, uh, into these methods, I need first to remind you or tell you uh, how we compute the susceptibility uh, within the MFT. Because before having the feedback of the collective mode, the first thing is to obtain it, therefore, to compute chi q of omega. So again, the first part is, is already in the review of 96. It's relatively textbook. But then we'll use and build on top of that later. So a little reminder first, I guess I'm probably not needed, but uh, on what's called one particle green functions to differentiate them from two particle green functions that are going to come in a minute. So these are the green functions with one C and C dagger couple 
and the Dyson equation with the self-energy defined like that. We know that these you know, quasi-particles are directly linked to at least two classes of experiments, I mean the photoemission, the angle result photoemission spectrum, and the STM. Um, and physically, at least in a Fermi liquid, we know that the self-energy will encode the properties of the quasi-particles. If you are in a Fermi liquid, you have a quasi-particle peak that will cross the Fermi surface here, and the property of that peak, I mean the lifetime, the width of that peak, the dispersion, the normalization of the dispersion by the interactions, uh, the quasi-particle weight, all are encoded at the low energy part of the self-energy. As Antoine said, there are much more in the self-energy than that, but at least there is that. So if we want to compute susceptibility or transport, I mean, this is clearly not enough in general because you would like to have the interactions between quasi-particles, and that is not really contained, I mean, not exactly contained there. So this leads me to ask the questions, where is the two-particle physics in DMFT? If you look at the equations and uh, derivations, so I don't exactly know how you wrote the, the self-consistency conditions, but probably uh, in this way. So DMFT is a single impurity problem here with one interaction and one retarded bath with a curl G, the vice field. Uh, here, to solve the MFT, you compute the one-body green function of the impurity, you compute the one-body self-energy, you're saying that the self-energy on the lattice is the self-energy of the impurity, and you have a nice self-consistency condition in the simplest case, and you solve all this problem. All of that is one-body physics, okay? So, which means, you, at the end of the MFT, you have computed the one-body green function. So, this raises two questions. First, how am I going to compute the susceptibility, the transport? And question two, Shouldn't I self-consist on two particle green functions as well? And that's what we are going to do. Basic question is, why is this U here the same as the U on the lattice? And if you think about it, yes, it's true in the MFT, but there is a priori no real reason. This model is an auxiliary model to solve an approximation. So we are going to relax this uh, in the following. So let's go to part one, okay? Susceptibility in the MFT. Okay. The first thing is, before I do anything complicated, if you want to compute a simple static susceptibility, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, there is a very simple way to do that, which is to put a field corresponding to that magnetization, solve the MFT in the ordered phase, that's a single particle problem, and use a good old formula that chi is dm dh at h equals zero, you don't need more, you don't need all the machinery I'm going to describe, okay? However, there are cases where you need more. If you want to compute the frequency dependency of the, of the susceptibility, if you want to compute the full momentum dependency, chi q of omega, especially if you're looking for incommensurate orders, uh, which you can't know, you know a priori, or if you want to have the general tensor of chi and study all possible instabilities at once, then you need to compute the full uh, susceptibility. And how do we do that? Well, we look in the textbook and we know that to compute transport, to compute response, we use quantum linear response theory, and we use a famous Kubo formula, which means that if you have a system and you put a field to uh, an operator B, for example, the magnetization, and you want to study the response of A, maybe also the magnetization, then you need to compute the retarded correlator here. That's the Kubo formula that gives you the response function. So A and B can be susceptibilities that will give you the magnetic susceptibility, the charge will give you the charge response, or the, con the current, current, current correlator will give you the conductivity. A and B are usually, uh, almost always, quadratic operators in C and C dagger. Therefore, immediately, this operator here will be a two-body green functions, two C daggers, two C. We don't have that already at the DMFT solution. We need to compute that uh, in order to compute transport. So now I need a little bit of um, formalism, okay? So I'll try to be as light as possible and as graphical as possible without too many equations because I will need that also to build the rest after. So these two particle green functions are defined in a very similar way on the one particle green function as C dagger C, C dagger C, at different times, different position in space, Different indices, A bar, A, A bar, B, B bar, A, B being the multi uh, index, an index, you know, for orbitals or spin, for example. So just a definition. These objects are big, 
you know, and complicated. There are four rank tensor on A and B, and they depend in general because of time translation invariance and, in, and uh, space translation invariance in simple systems on three momenta and three frequencies. And I will use this graphical representation later, where the object here is represented with two incoming, two partic two incoming particles, two outgoing particles, with momenta k plus q, mu plus omega, k, plus, k prime plus q, and so on, here and there. So in this way, and we're going to look at the, at the graph from left to right, in this direction, it's called the particle hole symmetric, uh, the, the, the particle hole channel, um, there is a net transfer of momenta q and omega, and we'll use that in the following. Now, you will immediately see here why these methods will be much com more complex than DMFT. This, uh, on the lattice, is really a monster if you want to have a, fi a fine grid in function of k and k prime, and we are going to struggle, of course, with that uh, in the following. So, in f if you are non-interacting, it's a non-interacting problem, the weak theorem tells you that this is given by two contractions, uh, which I represent graphically this way, by these two lines, where these are the bare propagators, Meaning the G2 is a product of two G0. If you know G0, you know G2, okay, in the non-interacting case. Now, in the interacting case, it's not true. The, one, the two body functions are not reducible to one body function. There is a correction. And if you, in general, what you have is the same term as before, now with full propagators. So the G, G terms, minus G, G terms, plus the proper minus signs to take into account fermions. Uh, plus the rest, and the rest is given by, by definition, F, the reducible vertex, which we are going to consider like, in, in the following. So in, in, the quasi, in the Fermi liquid, the interactions between the quasi particles are encoded somewhere in there. These terms are, you know, two quasi particles and particles do not see each other. These ones are the interactions. All right. Now, if we want to compute the Kubo formula, there is a slight subtlety uh, here. Is a point that you, you want to remove the, the disconnected part because you don't want to have the average of A. You want the response of A. And that means that, in fact, you should just remove this term if you look at the Kubo formula. So we define the susceptibility as being the same thing without the first term and call it chi tilde. That's called the generalized susceptibility. And that's the object we will need to compute. Uh, it's given by a term where particles don't see each other called chi naught interacting, even though they are full propagator, huh? don't be misled by the knot, and the uh, vertex correction, uh, F. The point is that the real susceptibility of the physical susceptibility are given by the sum and the contraction of this big tensor here with A and B. So depending on what you want to compute, you will have different A and Bs. But if you have the full tensor chi tilde, then you can compute all physical susceptibilities chi, q of omega, different channels, spin, charge, response, current, whatever you want. So graphically, if I close this, I will have this term, the bubble, plus the correction to the bubble. This, you probably recognize, is a famous Lindart function, uh, which gives the susceptibility of a non-interacting electron gas. And there is a lot of physics, included, you know, of course, enclosed in, in, the, in the Lindart function. And vertex corrections. Right. Um, okay, so now just a word here. For example, why, you, know, you could think, well, why are these vertex corrections important? Well, think, for example, about a, a non-interacting problem. This Lindart function here would give you the spin response and the charge response. They are equal. And imagine you are now in a MOT insulator. If you were going to neglect these, you would again have the fact that the spin response and the charge response would be the same, uh, which is, of course, very wrong because there is a, charge in, a gap in the charge sector and we know that MOT insulator can have low energy spin excitations like spin waves and antiferromagnets. So clearly there are cases where these objects uh, is very important and we need to compute it. It's not just a decoration. Now, to continue and finish uh, on how to compute the DMFT, the point is that DMFT is not going to compute directly F, that would be too simple. It's going to compute uh, another part of the, of the tensor. To do that, I need to remind you briefly about the Dyson equation, which I showed before. That's the Dyson for the one particle green function, which is a geometric sum of insertion of self energies. That's this equation or this equation. And the point is that to do that, you cut diagrams everywhere you can cut them by cutting one line. And the part which you cannot cut, which is one particle irreducible, that's by definition the self energy. 
And by doing that, you obtain a geometrical series, which is the Dyson equation, completely standard material. Why am I saying that? Because I want to generalize that to F, and the generalization to F, that's called the beta salpeter equation, which is represented here. So don't worry too much about these. This is just to decorate. Uh, the only thing uh, that, that I want to say is that F basically are some of diagrams. And you know, they are diagrams which you can cut by cutting two lines here vertically in this cutting them when you go from left to right. And these, we call them reducible. And those we can, which we cannot cut are called irreducible. So if I call irreducible the gamma, the gamma the irreducible uh, diagrams, then any diagrams is either irreducible or reducible. And if it's reducible, then it's the irreducible parts times two lines times anything. It's a recursive formula. Therefore, you have this equation, which you should put in regard with this one, which is very similar, uh, which is a reduction in irreducibility for the F uh, tensor. So now, of course, there are details. There are you know, four indices here. Uh, you need to put the indices correctly. So I wrote once in the lecture, the full formula with all the indices. You probably don't want to look at it too much. The only thing that you need to see, or you know, admit, is the fact that here, when we sum in these intermediate states, we sum over C and C bar and D and D bar and over the intermediate frequencies and spins. Therefore, if I group indices, this is just a matrix equation. And that's the beauty of it. So if I group the indices here, A, A bar, nu, K, and B, B bar, K prime, nu prime, and I leave K, Q on omega intact, uh, I'm diagonal in Q on omega, there, then I have a matrix equation which I can write as a matrix as F equal gamma plus gamma K tilde F. Right? You have a question? Um, so that's, that's the simplicity of it. Um, we'll see later that it's not always the case when we go to parquet equation, but um, at the moment it's, it's uh, relatively simple even though the matrix is big and complicated. So this is the irreducible vertex in the particle hole channel. Right? Right. Now, um, if I use for the susceptibility, I just put the, my equation which I had before, this equation for chi, so I replace F into it. I just replace this expression. I will see that chi tilde is chi tilde naught plus gamma plus gamma, plus gamma, gamma, gamma. I'm just saying the same thing twice. And that I can again write as a matrix equation, like chi tilde naught equal chi tilde naught plus chi plus that. Or gamma equal the inverse of the chi tilde, which again looks like a Dyson equation. This is the object which I needed. So then, hence this part of the formalism. Uh, now, the point is that to, of course, we don't know gamma, so we need to design approximation for it. And uh, standard approximation is the RPA, where you take that as a bare vertex. The question is, what does DMFT do? And DMFT will do something uh, very similar to the one particle physics. So to remind you, the DMFT is an atomic approximation of the luttinger ward functional. I think that was your second lecture, where you derived all of these uh, on the board. I will restart from there. So I will just show, again, the definition a bit later, but at the moment you can, if you can just admit it if you don't, don't, don't remember the details. But phi is just the sum of local diagrams, two particles, skeleton diagrams. The derivative of phi with respect to G is the self-energy, therefore the self-energy on the lattice is the self-energy of the impurity. That's just one body problem. Uh, now, the point is that gamma is just the second derivative of phi with respect to G, that's a general relation. Uh, therefore, uh, you see the approximation. I can just derive twice this with respect, the sigma dg imp, and the gamma of the lattice will be the gamma of the impurity. So the DMFT approximation says, to compute the susceptibility, use the gamma of the impurity instead of the gamma of the lattice. And that's, of course, a huge simplification because you remove all the momentum dependence here, uh, which is, of course, huge. But you keep all the frequency dependencies. So that's the DMFT equation for susceptibilities, because if you have that, you have chi. If you have chi, you can contract everything. And just to summarize what I said before, how do you compute any chi q of omega in DMFT? You solve DMFT. You compute the two particle green functions for your impurity problems. You use that to compute this gamma imp using the beta salpeter equation, the inverse form. Then go back to the lattice. Use again the beta salpeter equation. 
uh, as a function from gamma of the lattice. You have the, your carrier of the lattice, and then you have your final susceptibility. So you can compute any a priori any susceptibilities in this way for any Q, any omega, even though you have a single site approximation. I mean, you can compute. Therefore, you can compute correlation lengths because you have the Q dependence uh, in this. So that's point one. The second point is, as I said, however, this does not feed back into the self-consistent DMFT loop, and that's what we will want to correct. All right. So let me um, now show a very simple example. The calculation of that were done in the early 90s, but these curves here have been done by Thomas Schaeffer. He's here for the purpose of this talk, so thank you. Um, uh, as, uh, this is a one bound bound model again here, which we have in the same diagram. It, as before, we are going to dive here from high temperature along this arrow. And I am plotting here chi of Q on omega versus Q around pi pi for zero frequency. And we see a Lorentzian peak here, which you can, in fact, very well fit with an Orstein Zernike form. Uh, one a constant over Q minus Q A F times Xi square. And therefore, you can compute the Xi. And you will see that the Xi, of course, diverges when you reach the transition. So this is just to illustrate in a simple case that you know, how the machine reworks. You can just compute chi Q of omega uh, and have it plotted here. And these are different temperatures. You see that when you decrease the temperature and you reach the transition, of course, you get narrower and narrower, indicating that Xi is going to infinity. Now, this is a simple example. Um, there will be two talks this afternoon, which I will announce, which use this machinery. Well, at least one of them uses all of this machinery. So the two talks will be given by Hugo Strand, who is here, uh, and the second by Manuel Zingel, who is uh, probably here as well, yes, uh, both from uh, Flatiron CCQ, and they will talk about computing response functions and whole effect in a realistic setup for realistic material, the strontium routinates, a material that maybe you have also described this year or the year before. Yeah. Uh, so what Hugo will, will tell you is how to use this machinery to compute the, the, the magnetic susceptibilities in function of orbitals and, you know, fine all sorts of nice structures and magnetic excitations. And there are important physics questions related to that. And Manuel will discuss how we can understand the origin of uh, sign changes of the whole coefficient with temperature. But I don't want to say more because I don't want to spoil their, their talks. But this is a very nice, uh, very nice example for the susceptibilities. What I'm showing here is two a bit, two, a bit more sophisticated examples in cluster DMFT. To illustrate what I said before, that we can see pseudo gap, that we can see superconductivity in cluster DMFT already. One of them <coughs> is a calculation in the pseudo gap. That's a calculation which was done by one of our postdocs at CCQ, Shi Shen, a couple of years ago. And she computed within these eight patches cluster the susceptibility, which for the experts is quite an achievement. It's not easy. And they're computing the imaginary part of the susceptibility, chi, and then formed chi of Q of omega the 1 over T1, T ratio for, um, for uh, NMR, from NMR directly. And you can compute that here as a 1 over T1, T as a function of temperature for different doping. And what you see in the pseudo gap region is that you, given below some temperature, you have the effect of the pseudo gap, which we saw in the one particle grain functions, which we also see in the, the 1 over T1 uh, explicitly with calculations now. And that's quite new. You couldn't do that a couple of years ago. I mean, we were limited to one particle functions and RPS and all of that. Now we can compute uh, these using this technique uh, I mentioned. The second example is a relatively famous paper uh, in the community, at least, about um, the superconductivity in the Hubbard model using these methods to compute the static superconductivity susceptibility in the, on, uh, in the normal phase with very large clusters up to 26 sites, which is quite big. However, at a U, quite small, uh, so far from the transitions. And what Thomas Meyer concluded by plotting the inverse of susceptibility in temperature is the fact that you have an intercept at finite T, meaning you have a divergence. And therefore, you have a critical temperature on the Hubbard model as uh, a superconducting phase, at least for this regime of parameters. And of course, they were able to study different channels, S wave, D waves, and all of that using this, uh, this technique. So this is just to illustrate the technique uh, which I mentioned. OK, now I want to uh, move on to the second part, I mean, the real core of the talk, where I'm going to reuse all of this material. 
uh, to try to go beyond the MFT this time. And the, the point is I would like to make a self-consistent approximation uh, on the two particle level. So I will present two methods. Um, the one method, the first historically um, has been uh, developed by Alessandro Toski, who is here. Uh, it's called the Digamai method. The second one is uh, something I did with my former student, Myral, a couple of years ago. And I will here choose a presentation which we also did with Thomas using functional derivations. So I'm not going to follow history. I'm just going to give you a slightly different point of view, but uh, it, it gives you about the same, same thing. So functionals, why am I going to do that? Well, because Antoine has used that in his lecture. Uh, he has discussed the bame kananoff functional uh, and derived the MFT in this way. And in fact, it's a very um, common technique in statistical physics. I mean, you take uh, the physical quantity, you order parameter, you build a functional, typically the free energy, using the genre transform, you build grand potential and stuff like that. And you approximate the complicated part of your functional and then you obtain approximations. You can do that for magnetic transitions. You can obtain mean field this way, beyond mean field. Famously, you can do that for density functional theory with the functional of the electronic density. DMFT does this for the one-body green function. Well, what we want to do is to do it for the two-body green functions, at least some two-body green functions, and these are the, the, the approximation I want to show. So let me repeat what Antoine has been uh, saying in one, in one slide, uh, because I want to restart from there and to show you, in fact, that by taking two ideas together, the original idea of DMFT and an old idea of the 60s, one can in fact show that DMFT is one of a family of methods in a very natural way, and you know, that have you know, more physics now I want to describe. So let's go back to DMFT first. Uh, how do we build this thing? Well, we take the Hubbard model, okay, the action, and we have a quadratic source here, H, connected to the C and C dagger quadratically. That's what I can do. I put a field connected to the green function. And therefore, my free energy, uh, which is the integral of the path integrals, is a functional, functional this time, of H. The derivative with respect to H is going to give me G. That's the order parameter. That's the field, basic thermodynamics, except it's generalized to correlated functions, time correlated functions. And what I do to construct the free energy, I just take the energy here, uh, the free energy, to construct the grand potential, sorry, the gamma of G. I do the Legendre transform to eliminate H for G, and I obtain this functional, the bem canado functional, with two terms, one easy term and one difficult term, the sum of all these two particle irreducible diagrams, which DMFT will approximate, the Littinger Ward functional. Gamma has two properties. First, on the physical point, it's critical, dg d gamma equals zero, and second, um, uh, on, the, on the physical point, it's equal to the free energy. So the self-energy, as I said, is d phi dj, and then DMFT stops here and approximates this object. That was the derivation. So the idea is, well, let me take this functional. This functional is also a function of the vertex, of the interaction, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a second Legendre transform to eliminate lambda for the two particle grain functions using higher order functionals. And the fact is, all of that has already been done for me uh, in a very famous paper by De Dominicis and Martin in 1964, where they have built that for three particles irreducibility, four particle irreducibilities, and all the relation with the Parquet equation, which we did. So the only thing we need to do is to take this idea, take the DMFT ideas, and use them together. So DMFT will say, do an atomic approximation of this functional here. I will do atomic approximation on higher order objects. Um, so for what I'll do, I'm going to approximate not the self-energy, but the vertex. So there are two directions to implement that, and I want to briefly mention both. Uh, the trilex one and the digamai. So what I will do for both, I will show you the basic equations. If you don't follow for the full equations, because I still want to show them, it does not, well, it's okay. I will just show you after that a couple of applications of the methods trying to tell you what the basic points, uh, but I still want to show exactly this functional because, you know, otherwise, I'm just, these are just words. So, uh, to Trilex, what we do is that for our, for our anti antiferromagnetic fluctuation or our fluctuations, we associate a field, phi, explicitly, and we work in a language where we have electrons and bosons. 
So an electron, a boson with a propagator, and same Yukawa type theory uh, coupling, CC dagger phi between the two. W will be the green function of the boson. And if you're in the Hubbard model, you can simply decouple in the channel. Um, but there are other problems where there is, of course, a natural, a natural boson, like an electron for non problem, for example, uh, or more, uh, more specific uh, problems. So we're, we can work in this language. So what we're going to do is that, OK, this is the, the green function which I want to use, called G3, that the correlator C, C dagger phi. So it's a two body function because the boson is always made of two electrons. And the associate vertex, lambda, which is the same thing without the length, right? Uh, sorry, is this one? The lambda is this one. Um, there is a typo here. It should be G3. So what I'm doing is that I'm taking the bem kalanov functional and I'm doing a Legendre transform with respect to G3. And I have an explicit formula from the denominicis Martin paper, which is some terms as before, which you can write. There is one for the boson, one for the fermion. And then there is what was phi before is now written as an explicit term plus a complicated term here, function of the three body, uh, two body green function G3. And the remarkable property is that the derivation of that with respect to G3 is not the self energy, it's the vertex corrections. So that the corrections to the interactions, these are precisely what we are looking for. So this functional is given by three particularly irreducible diagrams, meaning this one is fine vacuum diagram. This one is not because I can cut here three lines and detach it. And I have exactly this formula. So this is completely general. And what the three legs does is to say, well, let's make an appro atomic approximation of these equivalent to the Littinger uh, functional. So in words, just saying that the, this functional on the lattice is the atomic functional uh, with all propagators being local. In other words, I'm approximating the vertex between the electron and the boson this time being the equal to the impurity vertex, not Q dependent, but omega dependent. And the immediate consequence of that is that your self energy will be given by a diagram like this with a fluctuation plus the vertex, which is approximated in this way. And automatically, you have two asymptotic regimes we wanted to have because this is an atomic approximation. Therefore, in the atomic limit, it's exact, like DMFT. In fact, if you solve it, you will see that you get the DMFT uh, solution. And at weak coupling, at weak coupling, there is no vertex corrections. So if there is no vertex correction, you remove this, and you have just your spin fluctuation theory I was mentioning to start in, in my starting point. So you have a theory that at least at very weak coupling, uh, we can discuss at moderate coupling, but uh, at very weak coupling, uh, you have the two regimes, the two asymptotic regimes built in, um, in the methods, okay? So the point is, that's great, but can we solve it? because uh, the non-trivial point is that you can write an impurity model and solve these things and so on. Let me just flash the equations. Yes, you can solve that. You can solve that with an impurity model here, which is a bit different from the MFT, because now the interaction starts to be depending on time and to be self-consistently determined. And that's a very big difference with the DMFT. The first difference, the second difference, is that you take the impurity problem, then you compute the vertex, the lambda imp, feed it back into the self-energies and the polarization, which are now k-dependent, and then loop to, to get that. This is the Trilex, Trilex set of equations. What we've shown in this paper is that you can also do cluster Trilex to have also the short-range uh, correlation physics if we want, and the control parameter, and we're able to benchmark that. So let me show two uh, basic applications. The method is very new, so it's not been uh, applied to many things uh, yet, but I want to come back to the superconductivity. And this is more a proof of concept. I mean, what can you do with this method on the Hubbard model? Uh, what you can do is that you can try to get the superconductivity here. And in fact, we were able to do that. That's the critical temperature as a function of whole doping. That's the superconducting dome here. The point is you can get that with a single site of impurity model, while in DMFT you need relatively large clusters, at least two by two because of the D-wave order parameter. And the physics is that because of the fluctuations, like in the weak coupling fluctuation theory, you can build the D-wave superconductivity. But because you also have the vertex on the approach to the Martin insulator, you will also get a dome, meaning the superconductivity will be destroyed close to the mod transition. So you have these two effects at the same time that give you this dome. OK, as I said, it's a proof of concept because we have now a lot of calculations with cluster DMFT, which are more refined because they are older. 
So, I mean, it's a very interesting question how to compare the two and understand the physics. So that's a single site trilex, one site trilex, but we could compare it to cluster DMFT. Yes? Uh, the, the, the blue line is the antiferromagnet. Uh, but, you know, there are two instabilities and we compute from the high temperature phase. I just didn't want to discuss it. No, because it's too, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm just, we do that all the time in, in cluster DMFT. I just, uh, I don't want to discuss the competition between the different orders at this stage. So that's, that's the point. Um, then the second thing is, um, we can do a, another case of superconductivity in a different kind of problem, a bit less uh, known probably, the case of ad atoms on a, a surface, a silicium surface, when you have ad, ad atoms put in, uh, on this surface, we can show that this can be described relatively well by an extended Hubbard model, this time with a long range Coulomb interactions on a triangular lattice, because the screening is not as efficient as it is in the bulk. So um, the point is that then we need a method that's capable to compute, to treat the one over R, the long distance interaction uh, in, these, uh, in these materials, and that we were able to do that with the group of uh, Philip Hansman, who is uh, somewhere also, uh, I guess, in the audience, yes, um, using three legs or extended, and, and or extended DMFT, which is a simplification if you want to, to, to view it this way. And we were able to, to predict the existence of a D-wave superconducting phase on this triangular lattice. Uh, there's still no experiments. There starts to be experiments with doping. But, uh, uh, yes? Okay. Uh, but there's no, no experiments. So at this stage, it, it's a prediction using this method. All right. So that was the first way to go. I mean, you take your excitations, you write a bosonic theory for it, and you start to approximate it, and you can get spin fluctuation physics plus the rest. Now, there is a different route, which I want to present as well, because it's older, and there are more results to that. Uh, that is the, the D gamma A, or the quadrilex. This is uh, the work uh, initially by uh, Alessandro and his collaborator. You can have a, a very exhaustive um, review about these uh, recently. I mean, uh, in, in last year. And what I will follow here to start with is a slightly different point of view, the functional point of view, which we done with Thomas in order to connect with what I have done before. So what we have seen previously was relatively easy. Now we are going to go to the core of the two-body uh, uh, quantum, the problem for, the, the, the many-body problem for, uh, with two-body particles. And what we need are the very famous Parquet equation. So, the point is what I said before for the relation between F and gamma, remember this relation, the reducibility of F and gamma was, if of course, correct, but it's only true, well, it's true, in fact, in, in a given channel. So there are three ways to write this kind of equation of reducibilities. Why? Because there are three ways to consider these diagrams. You need to group two uh, arrows on one side, two arrows on the other. There are three ways to do that. There are two particle hole channels and one particle-particle channel. So you can write these kind of equations in three different directions. So there are three notions of irreducibility. And the object I will really need here is not gamma, is another one, is lambda here, the fully irreducible vertex, which is irreducible this time in all channel. So if you take any diagram of F, in fact, there is only four possible choices. Uh, one. Uh, it's reducible in the particle hole channel. That's what we've seen before. Second, it's reducible in another channel going up, not in this direction. Or it's reducible in the particle-particle channel where you cut two lines going in the same direction. Or it's, not, it's irreducible in all of these channels, and there is no other solution. So F is the sum of all of these. And these generalize, if you want, the beta salpeter equation. These are the full equations from the fully irreducible vertex, and these are called the Parquet equation. If you want to see the first diagram of lambda, here it is. That's a diagram you cannot cut by cutting two lines in any ways. So that's that's a diagram. So now the difficulty of all these equations is that this is not a matrix equation. It's a tensor equation. So it's uh, more complicated to solve far by far. But that's what define lambda. So why am I showing the Parquet equation? Because it arrives naturally. And the reason is the following. I'm going to take again 
my Legendre transform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my free energy and eliminate u for g2, the two-body ring functions, uh, by Legendre transform again. And if I do that, I obtain again a, a formula, which is a, you know, sim a term which I could write, but it was a bit long to fit on the screen. And I don't want to show the details there. Uh, but it's explicit. And a complicated term here, which is the analogous of phi, or the chi we had before, which is this time the sum of four particle irreducible diagrams, given, for example, by these diagrams, vacuum diagrams that you cannot cut by cutting four lines. Not three, not two, four. And the derivative of this kappa with respect to G2, again, gives me the vertex correction. So if I do the Legendre transform, as I said, to eliminate uh, this function, I naturally obtain a functional, and the derivative is naturally the fully irreducible vertex. And this functional here is precisely the, such that it will generate the Parquet equation if you take the derivative. And I will not do that here. So physically, if you, know, you can show that this energy here, the, 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 the free energy here, is given by the average of the energy plus, minus or plus t times gamma 4, which means that this gamma 4 is nothing but the entropy of the system, which we consider the functional of the green functions. So again, we play the same game. We have the same kind of functionals. We have a complicated term. We approximate it locally by local terms. And you solve this problem with a local impurity problem. The point is that the, the techniques become more and more complicated if you uh, increase the irreducibility. But it's always the same idea. I take the Legendre transform. I take an atomic approximation. And I use an auxiliary problem to solve it. If you were really to do that, you would need to have a fully time-dependent uh, interaction here. There are equations for that. That's quite complicated. We call that quadrilex. Uh, and the difference between the two methods, the d gamma and the quadrilex, is that in the d gamma, one is going to neglect this renormalization, at least in the first to start with, of, uh, of the u, because you know, it's already complicated to solve. So that's the difference between the two. That's a somehow a minor difference, if you want. Uh, so, uh, the point is one derives from the functional, the other doesn't. So which one is the best, is, you know, we don't know at this stage. So you have your impurity model. You compute your, your, your vertex, solve the parquet, I mean, if you can, and compute the self-energies and loop. And if you really want, you can also have the renormalization of the interaction. Okay. Now, in practice, and I will now flash a couple of results uh, using this kind of method, in practice, Solving the Parquet equation is still very hard. One can do it, one starts to be able to do it, but in most cases, one does a further approximation, it's called ladder de gamma A in the literature, where we basically, well, people just uh, approximate the gamma on the lattice, not the full irreducible vertex, and solve the beta salpeter equations. And most of the calculations also do not fully solve the self-consistency because it's heavy. Uh, and so there are further approximations. But the point is, the, the general idea is relatively direct from the functionals. And after that, there are technical approximations because, well, we don't still know how to solve the full things all the time. And, you know, it's, uh, you know that's, that's quite normal. Um, now, let me come back to my problem, my, where, where I started with. I mean, my weak coupling benchmark of the Hubbard model. So if I again look at this problem here as a function of t, uh, uh, for a given u, I can go down the arrow here again. Then I can compute the correlation length uh, from a fit, as I mentioned before, of the susceptibility for u equal 2 here. And what we see here, the, the curve is a bit crowded, but there are a couple of methods. There is a mean field theory. You would see there is a divergence. You see DMFT, that's a gray line. I don't know if it's very visible from the back, but that's a DMFT, that there will be a divergence because there is a, a transition. Forget the green curve, which I will not try to, to explain. And here you have various, various versions of Trilex here, cluster Trilex, and D gamma A uh, on, on, the, on, the, on, the green, on the blue curve, showing that all of these show an exponential behavior, as you should, uh, at least if you plot these curves, as a function of the inverse temperature. There is also here some points. We have points of benchmark, real benchmark, this is determinant Monte Carlo. The curve is somewhere there. There is also diagrammatic Monte Carlo, which is done with uh, 
uh, Michel and Fedor uh, Simkovic, but here that the curve is specifically plotted is, is determinant at Monte Carlo, and you know, as usual, the benchmark stops when the method which you want to benchmark starts to diverge, but you know, that's, uh, that's life. We're probably going to be able to push that with, with diagrammatic Monte Carlo. But, I mean, that's, the point is that you see this behavior being, um, being restored. And that's, that we knew, okay? It's just a test of the method. Now, the point is, what about this uh, diagram that Antoine was also showing before? So, I mean, I don't probably don't need to explain it again because it was explained before, but briefly, as a function of temperature on U, what we want to see now is a feedback, this famous feedback on the one particle function, which, which I started with, meaning on the self-energy. So here, you would have the nail temperature of the DMFT somewhere there, okay? And forget for the moment the two lines. Here, you would have an incoherent regime. I mean, no metallic quasi-particles. Here, you would have a metal, well-formed, and here, you would start to see the pseudo gap. The, fact, the two lines correspond to the fact that it starts first at the nodes and then on the anti nodes, and there's the differentiation between the two, but that's not the main point I want to make here. The point is that when you go into this region, you start to see the pseudo gap, and we can see that here in the imaginary part of the self energy. These are high temperatures, you see no metallic behavior. So the color codes matches. Huh? This is a even though on the screen, the color doesn't look exactly like on my screen. So this is supposed to be orange uh, and different from this one. I'm sorry. Uh, so here in these curves correspond to these curves at high temperature. Then you see the metallic behavior in these regions. And then you go to dive into the blue region. You will see the dive of the imaginary part of the self-energies. And it, arrives, you know, it, it happens in the entire node and at the node, but, but later. This was uh, discovered in various... Uh, Works. There is also uh, a very nice work using uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo, which can be pushed in this region and can uh, deliver the complete solution in order to be able to test and benchmark. Um, but the point here is to make that uh, this feedback, which we were looking for, is indeed present in the YAMI. Now, my time is not up, but I don't have uh, much, a couple of more minutes. So I would like to flash a couple of applications, a bit more sophisticated of the uh, DGAMI method. Um, for example, one of the, I mentioned quantum critical point in my introduction as one of the problems which we would like to, to see. And there has been two recent works by uh, Thomas Schaeffer, and collaborator, Thomas is here, uh, about uh, quantum critical points, so which you can view as a first application of the DGAMI A to this kind of problem, um, and a kind of proof of concept that the method can handle these problems. So here, for example, in the three-dimensional Hubbard model, one can, uh, so in the three-dimensional Hubbard model, of course, you have an antiferromagnetic order as a function of temperature and doping. Um, and here you have a quantum critical point. So these authors were able to compute that within the, the DGMI methods, compute the, uh, study the critical exponent at finite temperature and recover the Heisenberg uh, transition, which is not unexpected, but uh, you know, it's very good to, to find, and find and study here the quantum critical point uh, in this region. Of course, uh, you know, one can ask you know, the question whether there would be corrections with clusters and how we would control the methods, but I think it's a very nice first step that at least the method in its first uh, incarnation, in its single site property, is able to capture all of these. Uh, by the same group of authors, I mean, uh, calculation of the periodic Anderson model, which is relevant for the, the um, heavy Fermi compounds, here you have again a quantum critical point between an antiferromagnetically ordered phase, at least at zero temperature, I think it's 2D case, uh, and a disordered case. And again, the method is capable to do that and to capture some non-trivial critical exponent for the susceptibility in the quantum critical regime, uh, which you, know, you could see there, but I guess the graph is a bit too small. You can see that there is a region where you see, uh, you see T square. And then again, the question is the same. You know, can we control it, and can we start from that and elaborate? But at least we have a, we have a starting point. Um, and since I don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, you can only, so, so this was done with ladder de gamma A, by the way. Huh? This was not done with a full calculation of the parquet. And since I don't want to leave you with the impression that we, we write the parquet where we can, nobody can ever uh, solve it, in fact, you can solve it, there's been a huge amount of work uh, in the recent years, in the group of Mark Charel in the United States, and then uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, I mean, in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna. Um, and one can solve them, for example, in small systems, 
like small benchmarks of you know, small systems, small rings like these with four, six, and eight uh, uh, elements. More recently, uh, there is a recent paper where the, 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 the parquet equation, the full parquet has been solved to study the physics of polaritons in strongly correlated systems. Um, and you know, so one can do that. Now, one of the key questions, which is the key of the approximation. The basic idea is that we make atomic approximation for that functional that gives us the vertex, which means that our vertex has to be local. The question is how, many, how much local is the vertex? How local is it? That's the quality of the approximation. How local is the irreducible vertex for d gamma a? How local is it for trilex? And you know, we start to have some information on that. We know early on, let's talk, for example, about the, the fully irreducible vertex first. We know from calculations for cluster DMFT from large clusters that indeed in some regime it's relatively local, at least in some regime of parameter. However, we also know that from these nano ring benchmarks, which I mentioned here, in some cases it is, in some cases it is not. It's as good. This is the plot as a function of frequencies of lambda for different queues. So you don't need to understand the figure. The only thing is that these figures are different for different queues. So there is queue dependent. Um, and therefore, there is no local part of the vertex. Therefore, you know, you probably need cluster d gamma a. Can we solve cluster d gamma a? Uh, maybe in the future, but uh, it's, it's not easy. We can solve cluster trilex because we don't have to solve all of the parquet equation. It's a much simpler method. In trilex, we have studied that as well, and we found that the, the, the vertex, the question is more subtle than that. The vertex is non-local only at low frequencies. As soon as you increase the frequency, uh, the, basically, the, the, the object is completely local, which leads to you know, doors of new improvement, technical improvement, and uh, you know, approximations uh, in order to, to progress in these without solving the, the, huge, uh, the huge vertex for a very large cluster. All right, so it's time to summarize. What I would like to summarize is that, indeed, by looking at the, the functionals and building functional and doing successive Legendre transform, and reusing this old work of, uh, of Cyrano uh, de Dominicis, we were able to build a family of methods. The first one is DMFT, the second one is Trilex, the third one is Quadrilex de Gamma A, by making successive approximation of functionals, which give us now the vertex corrections, three-leg vertex corrections, four-leg vertex corrections. All of these approaches can be solved with an auxiliary quantum impurity model, like DMFT. Um, maybe with renormalizing the interaction uh, in these, it depends on the cases. All of them are a local approximation of vertices, except uh, instead of, of self-energies. And the point is, all of them are a priori cluster controlled. They are, there is a cluster method for each of them, so this direction is completely orthogonal to the one of cluster. The cluster will give you the corrections. We can solve them at least for the three legs. Um, so these are different directions, which enables us to have this long distance mode and this feedback. And this is really work in progress. I mean, these methods are, are very new. Uh, there is a lot of technical work to be understood, how to compute the vertex, represent it better, solve these equations better, stabilize them in some regimes. Um, of course, we start to see, as we have seen, applications of these. Um, so there will be probably more in the future. One of the key questions to me is also, can we control the gamma with cluster? In which regime? And the question which is raised by Quadrilex, which is, do you really need do you need to also renormalize the interaction in the impurity model? Um, old work, which I quoted before, the Wilk and Tremblay, using the two-particle uh, self-consistent approximation, would say yes, that it is an important uh, aspect, but uh, one has to try and see, and the uh, future will tell about that. And so on that, I thank, let me thank my collaborator, uh, my former student, Tomai Rahl, my former postdoc, Jutta Vucicevic, Nils Fenzel, and Thomas Schaeffer for various work we have done on, on these methods. And on that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you.